We just played a bit of your first major work there. Right. It's going to rain. Take us back to that moment now from a technical standpoint. Right. What inspired you to use tape and loops? Uh, everybody, a, a lot of young people were really taking the tape loops in about 1962, 63, which meant in the old days, this is like a piece of plastic tape and you can put it in a metal block and you take a piece of white splicing tape and you put it together and it's literally a loop of tape. You can put it on a tape recorder, press the start button, it'll go around and around and around. If you use speech, which is, I found a whole lot more interesting than using electronically generated sound, which was the other, uh, possibility in those days. You get the meaning of the words, and then you get the speech melody. Dum ba ba da, dum ba ba da. It's going to rain, and the combination of a powerful speech melody, and in that particular uh, 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 sample that you just played, it was very strange. For the moment I recorded Brother Walter, which was his name, mm -hmm. uh, he said, "It's going to rain," and as he said it, a pigeon took off. So when you loop it, you get "It's going to rain," "It's going to rain," and you get wah, 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 wah. so we get a pigeon drummer. Wow. So uh, that, that wasn't accounted for, but that adds to the intensity of what you're hearing. You have no idea what you're hearing, and that's exactly, <laughs> that's, that's what it is. So uh, it's one of those moments when you turn out that something really, really, really works. Uh, another, another aspect of it is that he's talking about, no, he's talking about the end of the world, he's talking about the flood. Uh, this is 1964, 65, when I recorded him at the end of 64. This is about two years after the Cuban Missile Crisis, which most people listening probably will not even know what I'm talking about. But in a nutshell, Khrushchev, who was the head of Russia, said, I'm sending nuclear-tipped missiles to Cuba on boats. And JFK, who was president, said, if you do that, we'll hydrogen bomb Moscow. Now, that's not very settling information to hear. So everybody in America, me included, felt, you know, if this thing doesn't, clear itself up and these boats were just moving and Kennedy's blockade was just there, mm -hmm. we're all going to go up in radioactive smoke. So when, th thank God that didn't happen and Khrushchev backed down. But uh, the effects of that did not just blow away. They, they hovered over the country for several years. Mm -hmm. and, and in a sense, they're still hovering over our heads. So it's going to rain. It's kind of uh, like what James Baldwin said, the fire next time. It's, it's, Here's a, here's, a, here's a sermon about what was the, the end of the world in mm -hmm. the biblical period at a time when we are going through an entirely different situation, which has got certain analogies to it. So that's sort of hovering over the piece. And that why there's this, particularly in the second half of the piece, which gets pretty dark, uh, why I think it has the emotional intensity it has. So what's, what strikes you first when you're hearing these, uh, these bits of speech? Is it the meaning or is it the, the musical... Uh, the musicality of, of the phrase? It's a good question. The answer is that they're, they're, ma they're married together. I mean, how can you separate one from the other? When, when we speak to each other every day, every minute, the way we talk, I mean, some guy says to you, no. Well, you, you know, you know what that means. Another guy says to you, mm, no. Now, that's the same word, but the music there could be a major difference in the rest of your life, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, I mean, that, 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 we say, come home and we say something, and it wasn't what he said, it's how he said it. The, the speech melody and the meaning are just... They're melded together. They're melded together, exactly. And, and, and sometimes it's the melody which carries more information than the words. We're not always aware of that, though. You well, are. We, oh, we are aware of it. We are aware of it every day, or we, mm. or we, 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 we'd be dead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so we heard your early uh, work there with repetition and loops. Eventually, you apply those ideas to traditional instruments, pianos, violins, and in this piece, we're about to hear your own hands. Steve, could you explain what people exactly what people are hearing there? Well, I think it's the recording with me and Russ Hartenberger, who just uh, was is well known here in Toronto as a percussion teacher and uh, performer and uh, beloved member of the musical community and a member of my ensemble since 1971. Uh, and uh, I'm clapping one pattern, which is basically. <laughs> and Russell's clapping the same pattern, and after a certain number of beats, he jumps up one eighth note. So we're in a kind of a cannon, a row, row, row your boat situation. Mm -hmm. And then we hold that for a few minutes and then he jumps up another eighth note, another eighth note, until finally we're back in unison. And that takes about five minutes to do it right. And um, 
So uh, it's a real good piece to start a concert. It's kind of like, look, Ma, nothing up my sleeves. <laughs> and, uh, it's a friendly piece. It's short. It's it's funny in a good way, and um, uh, it's uh, it's proved to be, uh, you know, it's just, it started in 1972, so it seems to be having a, a good long life. Well, we've been talking about melody and speech, but what sort of statement were you trying to make here by just using hands? Well, I really wasn't trying to make a statement. You want, you want a little bit of the story? Yes. Okay, the backstory. Backstory is we're in Belgium on tour, and uh, the concert's over, and the guy who's uh, the uh, the you know who's running the uh, pay, who's paying us says, "Would you like to go out and hear some flamenco?" Uh, I, I, I cocked my head. I, I said, "Are we in Madrid? Am I crazy?" He says, "No, no, no. You're in Brussels." Look, he's paying for it. Let's do it. So we drive off into the foggy Belgian night, and we get to this club and go in, and we have a few drinks, and uh, two women come out, and they start to play guitar. Not very good. And they start to sing. Not very good. But they start to clap. And we, wow, what's going on here? So <laughs> after it was over, we go out into the foggy night, and we're both, you know, we're, we're a little drunk. And uh, I started, you know, we started improvising clapping patterns at each other. And in those days, I didn't trust anybody to give me anything. So I carried all my instruments, all my amplification equipment, all my tube amplifiers, you name it. 2,000 pounds of air freight. And I'm thinking, what if the air freight doesn't arrive? What if the power blows? Hey, clapping! <laughs> so that's the real genesis huh. of the piece. <laughs> but you've always been interested in rhythm. Yes. Yes. Going going back a long time, you played I was, drums. When I, when I was a kid, I took piano lessons, but at the age of 14, I had a friend who played better than I do, and we wanted to form a band, and I said, I'm the drummer, and I began studying with a guy by the name of Roland Koloff. He, he became the timpanist with the New York Philharmonic, but uh, I was that, studying snare you, drum with him. Is that when you fell in love with rhythm? Well, I think I have a gene, you know, uh, probably somewhere could, somebody could, you know, when, when we get around to doing those analysis, they'll dig up what, what it is. But uh, that's when I consciously realized I began studying and began, you know, making it a conscious part of my life. Okay, just a few short years uh, after you recorded that, you were making music that sounds like this. That is music for 18 Musicians, one of Steve Reich's most famous works. And this seems like the culmination of your previous works uh, up to that point. The rhythm, the phasing, the the looping. What does that piece represent for you personally? Real good piece. <laughs> Just a good piece of music. Uh, yeah, it, it, it made a big difference in my life because... Uh, it was recorded by a classical company, Deutsche Grammophon, believe it or not, in a pop studio in France. And the company was uh, hip enough to realize that, that it might be a successful record and that releasing it in numerical order on a, on a highly classical label, Deutsche Grammophon, might not be the wisest thing to do. So they held it in the can for a while and they said, well, we're going to release it on the orange label. They had a red pop label mm -hmm. and then they had the... Uh, yellow classical label. I said, well, what's the orange label going to be? I said, oh, it's going to be you, Chick Corea, uh, Karl Heinz Stockhausen, uh, um, you know, uh, Balinese music. I said, oh, great. Well, another year went by, nothing happened. So finally, I get a letter from the producer says, Manfred Eicher from ECM Records wants to release this. And I wrote back to him. And he said, I said, look, I'm not a jazz musician. He said, I know you're not a jazz musician. He said, but why, why don't you go down to New York and meet Bob Hurwitz? He handles ECM in New York. So I was in New York. I went out to meet Bob Hurwitz. And the, and the word on Bob Hurwitz was, he hates minimal music. So I walked in the office, a little chip on the shoulder, you know. And... Uh, so Bob says to me, I know, I know what you've heard. He said, I hate minimal music, but I love music for 18 musicians. Mm -hmm. And I want to send you around to progressive rock stations. Now, you know I'm talking a long time ago, right? And, uh, and to papers, you know, in, in New York and San Francisco and Los Angeles. And I said, are you serious? Because, you know, I was living in a, in a classical music get ghetto. Mm -hmm. And he said, yeah, I'm serious. I said, where do I sign, you know? And uh, the, the record sold over 100,000 copies in one year for a classical recording, and it was very uh, unusual. This is the days of vinyl. Uh, and the thing about Music for 18 was that it ended up in the classical bin, it ended up in the jazz bin, it ended up in the electronica bin, it ended up in the you know, uh, non-Western bin. And uh, it reached an audience, I guess, that I always wanted to reach, so this but was had the first... been unable mm -hmm. to do so. 
Uh, because my, you know, a lot of my music comes out of listening to John Coltrane, you know, particularly around the period of Africa Brass, say. Uh, so uh, uh, that, that was definitely, it was, it was a life-changing event, both in, in terms of the music and in terms of the direction of my own life. Professionally, it meant a Professionally, lot. Professionally, yes. It meant a great of... deal. It meant a great deal, yes. What's your relationship uh, with that piece today? Well, uh, I'm, I've got arthritis in two thumbs, so when I have to sit in, I recently had to sit in with the London Symphony in Singapore playing it. The time we got to Section 9, which is where I'm sort of carrying the load, and I got to play continuously for about six, seven minutes, I began to really, I, I began to cramp up, and I realized, you know, I, I, got, I got to get somebody to relieve me in certain of these sections here. I'm just not 35 anymore. Mm. So, uh, but I, I still love the piece, uh, and uh, I love a lot of pieces, and, and I... Uh, I don't, you know, uh, I'm very happy to replay older pieces if I'm physically able to do that. And uh, I'm, I'm very happy to hear other people do do them, but my mind is really on what I'm working on at the, at the moment. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's pretty much the case for most composers. Uh, starting in the 1980s, something changed for you and your music. I'm going to uh, play a piece here called Tehillim. As Steve Reich with Tehelim, the Hebrew word for psalm. So, Steve, what changed uh, at that point in your life uh, that caused this uh, change in your music? Well, I had uh, made a trip in 1970 to Ghana, uh, where I, because I wanted to study uh, traditional uh, Ghanaian drumming, because I'd read a book filled with notation, and uh, that was very valuable. But the most valuable thing would be to actually play it. And uh, I was able to work out the details and got there. And uh, a, there is no musical notation in Ghana. Uh, music is passed on from father to son, from mother to daughter. And uh, when I came back, I thought to myself, don't I have any kind of uh, um, oral tradition in, in my life? And I began to realize, as a Jew, I'm a member of one of the, uh, perhaps the oldest ex existing groups that still uh, maintained its... Uh, its existence for uh, going on 4,000 years, and I don't know anything about it because I was raised Reform, and I, got, I didn't know Aleph and Bay, I didn't know anything. Mm. So I began uh, getting some Jewish education, and meaning the language and some of the practices, dietary rules, the Sabbath, other things. And uh, as study leads to practice, I thought, well, I want to bring this into my music. And, uh, well, what, I want to set a Hebrew text. Well, what's the most obvious text? The Psalms were meant to be sung. We don't know how they were sung because in the West, amongst the Western Jews, uh, there, there, is, there is no living tradition. The only Jews on earth who do have one are the Yemenite Jews who stayed in Yemen for, for you know, since the Babylonian dispersion. Hmm. Uh, and I'm not a Yemenite Jew, so I didn't have that. So I literally decided, okay, well, I'm just going to set the Psalms, you know, as a, as a composer. So I got the Hebrew and English uh, versions and tried to pick selections that I could say to anybody, Jew or non-Jew. And I'd say the words over and over again. The first uh, the, the text of what you were hearing there is uh, the opening of the 19th Psalm, the heavens declare the glory of God, Hashemayim Masaparim Kavod Keo. And I'd say them over and over and over again. And like composers have done, you know, for thousands of years and still do, a melody popped in my head. Hmm. Same time as the melody popped in my head, this popped in my head. One, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one. I thought, what's that? Well, what that was, was unconscious memories of Stravinsky and Bartok and their changing meters in the Rite of Spring and Bulgarian rhythms that I'd heard years and years and years ago, hmm. just sort of un, you know, uncalled for popping up, saying, hey, hi, we're still here. And I thought to myself, well, maybe somehow or other the classical Hebrew, you know, calls that up. And I thought, well, by the time I write the second movement, it'll, it'll turn. But it didn't. It just stayed there for the whole piece. So a uh, part of being, I think, one of the best pieces that I've ever written, uh, uh, I remember that was the first piece where I walk around the house and my wife would say to me, you're really singing. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good sign, isn't it? That was a good sign, yeah. yeah. I, I figured that was, that was good news. Hmm. So... Uh, 
uh, was that I basically got a whole new rhythmic vocabulary that then began to pop, crop up of an instrumental music and whatnot. Because mm. prior to that, in drumming music for 18 musicians, they'd basically been using a certain kind of triple meter, you know, two, three, or one, two, three, 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 four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. Different divisions of, of, of uh, 12 uh, that are basically uh, built into a triple meter, uh, some kind of, uh, of a... Of a Three, four, right, as opposed to you know the standard four, four that you'd find in most rock, and uh, so this opened up the idea of of constantly changing the meter, which again just happened as a as a gift, if you like. So it got you singing, and it gave you new rhythmic uh, exactly ideas. Exactly so. Yeah. Exactly so. Hmm. Well, uh, the examination uh, of your heritage, it, it continued. It carried over to different trains yes. for which you won a Grammy in 1988. Uh, it explored the Holocaust using snippets of interviews with survivors. I want to play a clip here. Okay. On my birthday. The Germans walk in. Germans invaded Hungary. Steve, what were you hoping music could contribute to our understanding of the Holocaust? Well, I'll tell you the truth. If anybody had come up to me and say, Steve, would you like to do a piece about the Holocaust? I'd say, Are you crazy? Want me to drink the Atlantic Ocean just for starters? Uh, but what happened was this. I, uh, I had discovered the sampling keyboard by listening to pop music back in the days of the Fairlight and all those kind of things back in the 80s. Mm-hmm. And I thought, wow, this is just, just the kind of thing I'm looking for, you know, where you could, on the and of three, you could press a button and any sound would happen. But, and I had been asked uh, to write a piece for Kronos just when Kronos is kind of getting well known as a string quartet. So uh, my wife, the video artist, Beryl Carl, said, why don't you use the sampler for this piece for Kronos? It's a great idea. No idea, well, what's going to be in there, you know? So first I thought, oh, I know. It'll be the voice of Bella Bartok. What else? Well, Bella Bartok was, uh, ended up uh, old and, and just about broke and sick in New York City and near the last couple of years of his life uh, transcribing folk songs up at Columbia University. And he made a couple of recordings in English for WNYC in New York. And I got a hold of them. But then I began to think, wait a minute, I'm writing a string quartet. Do I want Bella Bartok, who wrote the greatest string quartet since Beethoven, sitting on my shoulder? Wait, it's hard enough as it is. So, psh, get that. Then I thought, oh, it'll be the voice of Ludwig Wittgenstein. It was a philosopher. I, just, I discovered it, or I studied at Cornell. Mm-hmm. Wittgenstein died in 51, uh, 53. Uh, in the only, he was a recluse. The only recorders around were wire recorders. There were no recordings of him. So don't ask me how I popped into my head these trips I took as a child. My parents were divorced when I was one year old. My father's a lawyer. He lived in New York. My mother's a singer-songwriter. She lived in Los Angeles. Uh, and uh, I, they were divorced uh, in 19... I was born in 36. They were, divor- they were divorced in 1937. So between 1937 and about 1941, when I started going to school, I would, they had what they called divided custody. Six months in New York, six months in L.A., take the train back and forth. So uh, uh, I began thinking about these train trips, and I went out to speak to Virginia, who was really my nanny. My, she was like my mother, really, the first 10 years of my life, because she was there through all the back and forth. Mm-hmm. And we were just reminiscing. I was just, you know, talking about the old days. And then I located Lawrence Davis, who was a black Pullman porter, uh, who uh, his, his wife had passed away, his children had left. He was, had a this incredibly resonant voice. The Smithsonian had recorded him as part of American oral history, and he loved to talk about the trains because that was his, that was his heyday, that mm-hmm. was his life. He was taking soldiers from the West Coast back to fight in Europe, and taking the East Coast soldiers up to the West to fight against the Japanese. So I spoke with him, and basically, they, he was reminiscing about his life, and it popped in my head. Well. When I was taking these trips, 37, 38, 39, what was going on in the world? Well, hey, we know what was going on in the world. Mr. Hitler was trying to take over the world, grabbing any Jew he could find, first taking them below Munich to Dachau, and then finally over to Poland, up the chimney, and 
if that, if I had been born in Dresden or I had been born in Stuttgart or I had been born in Brussels, you and I wouldn't be having this conversation. Mm-hmm. So then the light bulb went, went on in my head. What if I could get recordings of people who had survived this talking about their lives, just the way Virginia's talking about her life and Mr. Davis is talking about his, only their lives were very different. And it turns out at Yale, they have an archive of survivors. And I went up there and I listened for several days and, you know, heard one amazing thing after the other and selected those people who had particularly musical tones of voice and um, brought that back. And uh, again, I became not so much the composer as the faithful scribe. Hmm. As they spoke, so I wrote. When Virginia said, from Chicago, I wrote down, but eat them. And every wow. time she sang, the viola would play that melody. And then Mr. Davis said, but today they're all gone. The cello would double him. And the same thing with the Holocaust survivors. So that the idea was, I am transcribing what is being said in a very melodic tone of voice mm. into a melody for one of the string instruments. Most people would assume this would be an extremely challenging piece to tackle. But from what you're describing, it's a simple, a very organic process making this? Well, it was a lot of work because mm-hmm. uh, people people don't talk, you know, if I said to you again, hey, say that in A flat, you know, you look at me like a <laughs> cuckoo and you'd be right. <laughs> so, And this was before pitch shifting and... Exactly. Yeah. Well, actually, it, th- there was some, but I, I, I felt the time, we're talking 1988, so that's yeah. just coming on the market. Mm-hmm. But I felt the the ethos the, 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 of the piece is these are these are the people... This is their experience. I am transcribing their experience as faithfully as I can, so I'm not going to avail myself of these possibilities of playing around with their voices. Mm -hmm. And I'll just have to make the shifts of key and tempo necessary to accommodate one voice into the next, to sort of make some kind of cohesive, you know, in in the English language story out of what's happening. Mm -hmm. So it was was a very challenging, very time-consuming piece, but it was also an inspired piece. So... um, uh, that gives it, you the inspiration got, to to tackle the musical challenge. Yeah, in other words, the the, yeah. cha- the challenge was met by the energy that, mm. that that I had at the time. Yeah. Well, since different trains, history has become a fertile source of inspiration for you. Your 2002 opera Three Tales addressed the Hindenburg disaster, nuclear weapons, and genetic cloning. And in 2011, you premiered WTC 911, your meditation on September 11th, featuring interviews with eyewitnesses and first responders. We're going to play an excerpt from that. eyes just kind of shot up. My eyes just kind of shot up. Clients. Clients. One of the towers. One of the towers just in flames. But we all thought. But we all thought it was an accident. Accident. So, Steve, what compels you to tackle these major historical events through music? Uh, we lived for 25 years, four blocks from Ground Zero. And um, on, on 9-11-2001, uh, my wife and I were in Vermont. But my son, my granddaughter, and my daughter-in-law were at our place, four blocks from Ground Zero. And about 8.30 in the morning, the phone rings up in Vermont. And my son says, they bombed the Trade Center again. I couldn't see it, but I felt it. You know, it was bell and bomb previously before, and then they hit the garage only, and a lot of smoke went up, and some people died of smoke inhalation. And they were coming back to finish the job. So I said to him, uh, you know, uh, he, he sure, blah, blah, blah. and he said, turn the TV. We all turn the TV, second plane hit, and it's very clear what was going on. So I told him, look, don't hang up. Go in the bathroom. There's some hardware store masks. Put them on yourself. Put them on the baby. Don't leave. Don't get out of the apartment. I knew we had a very together neighbor who had a had a, a, a van, and I knew he'd be back to get his family, and I knew that he'd check online. Sure enough, from about 8.30 in the morning to 4 o'clock in the afternoon, the phone miraculously stayed open. Neighbor came home, got them out, took them north of the city. Couldn't drive in the west side highway, couldn't drive in the east side highway, but if you knew what you were doing, you could get out. He got out. We drove down from Vermont, picked them up, and for 30 days we had to stay there. So all of which is to say it was not a media event for me on that level. Okay, uh, I'd say a month or two after it happened, I was doing an interview with some magazine, and they asked me because they knew about different trains and 
pieces we've just discussed. Are you, or am I going to make a piece out of this? Because they know that I dealt with documentary material. At the time, I was finishing up this video opera, which you mentioned, uh, 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 Three Tales, uh, the Dolly section about cloning, and I was working with samples and electronics and more samples, and I just felt one more sample, man, I'm going to get sick, you know, enough. So I said, absolutely not, you know, forget it. Mm -hmm. And for seven years after 9-11, I did nothing but instrumental and vocal music. 2009, the phone rings. It's David Harrington from Kronos on the phone. He goes, Steve, how are you doing? We'd like you to write a third piece, and we'd like you to use pre-recorded material. David, for you, anything. <laughs> Hang up the phone. No idea. Zero. And then, I don't know, a couple of weeks, and finally the light bulb goes on in my head. Wait, I've got unfinished business. Now I've got the time and the inclination to go back. It's been seven years and do that kind of work again. And I knew then immediately what I had to do. I had to go to the people again who were involved, who were there. First people who were aware of it were the uh, NORAD, were the air, air traffic controllers. They were the ones who saw that the American 11 going from Boston to L.A. was going south, and you don't go south to get from Boston to L.A. The second group of people who became aware of it, uh, some of whom are not with us anymore, the New York City Fire Department. And uh, I was able, by working with the fire department, to get access to their field communications, which are very funky, <laughs> kind of, but they mm -hmm. got the real nitty-gritty of what was going on that day. Then, after that whole sort of first movement of the people who were directly involved, uh, I went out with my own little digital recorder and went to my friend's nine years later, who lived in the neighborhood. And basically, you know, what were you doing that morning? Taking my kids to school, whatever it was. Taking a little extra time, otherwise I would be dead. Uh, and um, then in the third, act, third movement, uh, something happened which was a, sort of a bit of a surprise. I was reading in the paper, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a, tr a traditional Jew, but I didn't know that in Judaism there's a law that when a person dies, you don't leave the body unattended until it's buried. So somebody has to some, has to be with the has body. has to be with the body, usually reading Psalms or parts of the Bible, you know, like keeping the company. We believe the there's two levels. One level that goes back to the Middle Ages, you know, rodents and whatever would attack mm -hmm. the body. Other that is that on a spiritual level, we believe the the soul and shama, whatever you want to call it, is sort of hovering over the body, waiting for the burial so it can go wherever souls go. Mm. So Anyway, uh, they're, 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 the, in 9-11, uh, there weren't that many bodies. There were parts of bodies. So there was a very long, extensive DNA analysis going on, and it was up on, um, in the East 30s near NYU Hospital on the east side of Manhattan. So the, they wanted people who could come 24-7. And uh, uh, since this was, a, 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 the, this, this was a Jewish practice, on the Sabbath, you're not allowed to carry money, you're not allowed to carry public vehicles, so on and so forth. So they found a school, Stern College of Women, which was a religious school, and they went to them and said, look, you live within walking distance of, of, the, of, of NYU Hospital. Would you, would, would you consider you know, committing yourself to a 24-7 thing? They mm -hmm. said, we'd be honored to do it. When I read about that, I thought, wow, you know, out of this horrible thing, here's some beautiful thing. I want to locate to some of these women and record them. And I found two of them, and one of them was the former president of the music publishing company that publishes my music, Bruce Lee and Hawks, who had quit and become a lay uh, chaplain at Columbia oh, wow. Presbyterian Hospital and then volunteered to do this not during uh, during the uh, aftermath of 9-11. Mm. So... Uh, the the, uh, the piece is in three sections, and uh, it's it's all tied to to the document documentary material, and it's all it's, it's scored for three string quartets, all of which are played by Cronus by overdubbing, and uh, and the pre-recorded voices. But again, I, I, it if it wasn't something personal, it meant something to me. I wouldn't have had the energy and the whatnot to mm -hmm. to car carry through with it. So I think in in general, if there are any composers listening. You know, whatever you do, make sure you're really emotionally invested in it because if it, you know, <laughs> it don't mean a thing if it ain't got that personal commitment. <laughs> well, it's interesting. We've just been talking about a, a couple pieces that, that document history. Right. And your work is sometimes like a metaphor for history in that we have these patterns slowly changing, creating these interesting effects, surprising effects. Okay. Is that, is that intentional? 
Well, in the early pieces, I was aware that, uh, like, uh, I mean, really, like a piano phase or uh, even drumming or uh, parts of music for 18 musicians, that, for instance, music for 18 musicians, there are four women singers. And a lot of times people on, on a recording will say, I don't hear any women. And, and I, I kind of smile because I know they, they really, they, they're serious, they don't. But if the women weren't there, they'd miss them. Now, in, 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 in classical music, that's considered good orchestration. You don't hear it sticking out in front, but if you take it away, man, hey, what's, what's, what's wrong here? <laughs> they add life, literally. <laughs> their, their human voice yeah. adds life. Because what they're doing is half of the women are imitating clarinets, so they sound like Ella Fitzgerald. Do -ba -da -do 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 -ba -do -ba. <laughs> the other women are imitating violin, so they're going, eee. So they're becoming part of the musical ensemble by becoming... Uh, human instruments, as my producer used to say, voice instruments. Now that's that's a way whereby you will hear things that you another time another thing in the same in music for eighteen people will say to me when they hear the bass clarinets playing this real raspy sound which I stole from Eric Dolphy, great jazz musician who used to play with John Coltrane as you know, and uh, occasionally, and uh, uh, when people hear it on recording they say, hey man, what, what synth patch is that? I say, yeah, I tell you, that's called the bass clarinet. <laughs> so yes, you, yeah. you, there there are there are uh, things that I, I didn't intend. They're simply things I did say. This sounds good. This is really good. Which then people hear and either interpret as electronic or as non-existent. Mm. Uh, okay, so uh, while you've continued to produce uh, work, your earlier pieces have been embraced by younger audiences far beyond the classical world. Uh, I'm going to play one for example. That was a bit of British beatmaker's cold cut uh, with a more dance floor friendly version of Steve Reich's uh, music for 18 musicians. Why do you think your music has such broad appeal outside of classical circles? When I was 14 years old, uh, a friend came over and said, you got to hear this. I never heard it. I, I never heard or played any music uh, before Haydn or after uh, Wagner when I was a, from, from birth until age 14. He, he said, come on, I want you to hear something. He played me The Rite of Spring by Igor Stravinsky, and my jaw fell on the floor. I couldn't believe it. A couple of weeks later, he said, come over, and he played me Johann Sebastian Bach, the fifth band of Ricochet. Couldn't. Then another friend of mine said, hey, come on over, and he played me Charlie Parker, Miles Davis, and Kenny Clark. And I just turned to my friend who was a better piano player, and I said, I'm going to be Kenny Clark. <laughs> now, I never succeeded, because nobody could be Kenny Clark but Kenny Clark. But I began studying percussion with Roland Koloff, and uh, my life uh, as became devoted to percussion in terms of, terms of becoming a musician. And uh, uh, I think if that's your background, and this continued, this wasn't just a passing thing. Uh, I followed, you know, um, Miles Davis, you know, from the, the, the early, through his days as a sideman with Charlie Parker up through his incredible groups that include John Coltrane. Then John Coltrane became a huge focus, and I would say that uh, a lot of what I've done, and perhaps other people who did, quote, minimal music, uh, might not have happened, or might not have happened when it happened, if it hadn't been for pieces like Africa Brass, where John Coltrane and Eric Dolphy are playing on the low E of, of Jimmy Garrison's bass for 16, 17 minutes. So you say, hey, man, what's the change to Africa Brass? E, no, 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 what's the change? It's E, E, E for 16, 17 minutes. And you say, hey, man, you know, come on. <laughs> but So how do you make it work? Well, because Coltrane is playing sometimes gorgeous melodies on his soprano or tenor, and sometimes he's just screaming through the instrument. So you've got this incredible melodic variety going on. Eric Dolphy's doing the orchestration of the brass, and he's got these whoop, 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 sounds like elephants coming through the jungle. It's glissandos on a French horn. Uh, and you've got this incredible rhythmic complexity, because Elvin Jones is like, you know, six drummers rolled into one, and all this is going on. So if you have rhythmic complexity, timbre variety, melodic invention, you can stay in E for 16 minutes and be absolutely glued and riveted. Mm. So that was a lesson. That was, a, that was instruction. Um, and I'd assume if that's in your DNA as well, no matter what 
exact, music you're exactly. making. So that's the gonna... point is, I don't want to be a jazz composer because I'm not. That's mm -hmm. phony, baloney. I want to be me. But I, me is is certain influences that meant a lot to me. So the experiences that I had in Ghana, and the experiences I had at Juilliard, and the experiences that I had with things at John Colton, and I must have heard it play live 50 times, hmm. whether I was at a jazz, jazz workshop in, in San Francisco or at the Five Spot, you know, sometimes with Monk in New York. So uh, this is something that was really a part of my growing up as, as an American musician. And it's going to come out and it's going to form these bridges. And it's going to come out by itself. Yeah. Just leave it be, do what you do, don't worry about it. It'll be there, and it was. Hmm. Uh, and people picked up on that, and that's why they're these remixes. It, it's amazing how that happens. It just comes out naturally in this way that forms right. these bridges to other people's And that's ears. what works. Mm -hmm. When you try, mm. <laughs> <laughs> People can smell it. <laughs> okay, we've talked a lot about uh, the energy it takes to tackle some of these big projects. And one final question for you. What's inspiring you right now? I just finished two pieces, uh, which are going to be done uh, in first the Carnegie Hall, and then they're going to be done in London in November. Uh, one of them's called Pulse. It's very, uh, uh, really for me, relaxed, constant piece with, uh, for winds, a couple of winds, a couple of strings, piano, and electric bass. And electric bass just plays, it might as well be Giorgio Moroder. <laughs> but but it, 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 it keeps even throughout, and the piano sometimes is the same, sometimes a little bit more uh, irregular. Uh, and then another piece is called Runner, and it has nothing to do with running, but it is sort of paced. And uh, that's for the Royal Ballet in London, but really it's for any group that wants to play it, and it will be choreographed. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, the choreographer said, I was wishing for, it's, it's 15 minutes long, he said, I was hoping you'd write something longer, so what I'm going to do is, I'm going to start off with It's Gonna Rain, I'm going to choreograph that, and then I'm going to do your new piece. So I'm really waiting to see what that's going to be like. <laughs> it's, too, it's like the oldest thing I ever did and the latest thing I ever did, and they got oceans apart so uh that would be fascinating i, I think it's one you'd enjoy <laughs> sounds good well thank you so much uh, my pleasure my pleasure thank you